feet or, uh, you know, six feet or wearing our masks and all those things that are just a part of our normal daily lives these days. Um, we've that's really been the main focus of my administration for the past year is working through the pandemic. So I want to talk a little bit about what we did in 2020. And, um, and then we can get into uh, some of the things we're continuing to work on outside of COVID, which is water sewer infrastructure updates. Um, and then Sean's here to talk about development within the city and projects for 2021 and beyond. Um, although COVID forced some pauses on some projects here in Lakewood and also nationally, we are moving ahead on a lot of fun and exciting projects. So I wanna relay, relay those to you as well. So um, getting right into it, um, here's a slide on recent uh, criminal activity. Um, I didn't get a chance to include, uh, unfortunately, we did have um, a homicide uh, over, over the weekend um, at, that the Lakewood Police Department did a very nice job and, and has arrested suspects in that incident. Um, but you know, related to what's going on, it's nearly every day that we're seeing gun-related violence across a region, and nationally, these gun-related incidents have been far too common, and now they're, they've hit Lakewood as well. After a year-long pandemic that's resulted in loss of income and livelihood, paired with easy access to guns, I do fear that we may see similar incidents over the next few months. We have to have an appropriate and effective response to these incidents, um, which I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide. But before we get into next steps, um, I wanna provide an update on some of the recent incidents. In most cases, as you can see, the suspect has been uh, apprehended by Lakewood Police Department. I want to thank the police department for their hard work and careful steps to apprehend these criminals. Um, and I also do wanna take a few minutes to speak directly about the incident at Madison Park um, that occurred in mid-April. So on uh, Tuesday, April 13th at 6.45 p.m., Lakewood Police Department was called to the park after a report of gunshots being fired. The police arrived on the scene and discovered an 18-year-old male with two apparent gunshot wounds. The victim was quickly taken to Metro and is recovering. Um, I also do want to um, thank uh, the first responders, our EMS and our park security guard that were able to attend to the victim and most certainly uh, save this man's life. Um, at this time, we do have two people in custody um, and charged uh, with that, that crime. Now this incident at Madison Park has certainly rattled our community and for good reason. Our parks are our local treasures and everyone should feel safe to enjoy them day or night. Um, since the first earlier incident at Madison Park, I've been working hand in hand with our police department uh, and community partners to come up with solutions to keep our parks safer. Uh, again, I'll go into those a bit more in the next slide. I also understand that an increased police presence may not make everyone feel safer. So recently I sent a communication uh, along with members of council did the same as well to the anti-racism task force so that they can make recommendations on um, equity and inclusion uh, so that everybody feels comfortable uh, in our parks, especially the BIPOC community. I do also wanna take a moment and talk a little bit about communication and how we communicate here at City Hall, especially with these high profile incidents that have unfortunately hit our community recently. Um, lately, there appears to be this, this rush on social media to be the first to post about some sort of gun related or high profile incident. I just wanna remind everyone that first is not always best. The police department uh, and myself have the duty and ob obligation to ensure that anything we communicate is thorough re thoroughly reviewed and accurate. Uh, these are very serious matters and we need serious, accurate and thoughtful communications. Um, the night of the Madison Park in, uh, incident, for instance, I spent much of that evening both at Madison Park and at the police station uh, reviewing camera footage and staying on top of the investigation. As soon as the police department has enough information, they will issue a pr press release to the media. Uh, following that press release, if necessary, I then will work with our law and police department on issuing a statement from my office. 
Um, both of us have the responsibility to ensure that our statement is reviewed uh, and is accurate. Um, and I wanna be absolutely sure, certain that we're not releasing information that could later impede the investigation. So I know uh, people are very anxious for information and I just wanna ensure everyone that the police department, myself, city council, we will get to you as it, it, it provide the information as quickly as we possibly can. But again, it has to be accurate and reviewed. And again, we don't wanna impede the, the, the investigation moving forward. Um, we've also recently updated the police page of our website. Um, so if you go to our website, go to departments, hit police, and there's press releases where you can see the most recent press releases for some of these high profile incidents. Or you can also always contact my office or the police department for information directly. So just rest assured, we wanna get information out as soon as possible, um, but it has to be accurate. Next slide, please. So in this slide, I've included some short and long-term solutions um, that we are providing to address uh, gun, gun violence within our community. You know, none of us wanna live uh, in, a, in a police state or an environment that we have to have an officer at our parks to make us feel safe. Um, for safety in our community, it's really gonna take all of us working together to, commit, uh, to keep our community safe. So, but in the short term, we do have an officer, a an, uh, uh, an officer assigned to Madison Park uh, there in the evenings, seven days a week um, at the park. They've been instructed to get out of their, their cruisers, walk around, make themselves known. Um, and that will be uh, ongoing for the foreseeable future. We also have increased patrols at the parks. So when officers are on their regular patrols outside of the Madison Park detail, um, when they have some downtime, if you will, they've been instructed to go to all of our parks, get out of their cruisers, walk around. Um, this is something that uh, Chief Kauchak and I discussed before uh, some of these incidents at our parks. We really wanna focus more on community policing and police officers getting out of their cruisers and interacting and building relationships within our community. So those are those are things that that's going to maintain be maintained long term is those kind of foot patrols and getting out the bikes as you see in this picture during the summer months. We've also adding high tech police cameras. Um, if you've known since about 2006, the city has uh, annually invested in um, having police cameras throughout our community. There's a new higher tech police camera that's available um, that is being put up within the next couple of days, if not already. Um, and, and we will be installing those throughout the community to assist the, the police department when a crime does occur. Um, we, we don't. And we wouldn't even have the staffing, uh, nor any police department would have the staffing uh, to monitor all those cameras. We're again, we don't want to live in a police state. But what's useful about these cameras is if there is a crime, for instance, at Madison Park, um, they would be able to pull a license plate and help the police uh, capture uh, some of the, uh, the the suspect or the criminal in that case. Um, adding our park security guards. Um, so enhancing that effort as well, making sure that our uh, park security guards are up at Madison Park or up at Lakewood Park or up at Wager Park and Kaufman Park, um, making their presence known at the parks. I've also been meeting regularly, uh, as I always have, uh, with our police department to discuss ongoing issues and ways that we can strengthen our police department and strengthen our relationships between the police and our community. And then finally, trauma response. Um, the trauma of this incident has impacted all of our community. Um, and uh, a couple of weeks back, the Lakewood Schools provided a letter to parents informing them of some resources that were available to deal with the trauma. Um, here at Lakewood, we've partnered with Frontline Services to provide additional support and trauma services to community members impacted by the traumatic events um, of that event at Madison Park. Please contact our human services department if you, someone you know, um, would like to be connected with frontline services. Um, this was a very traumatic experience and we wanna make sure that those are, that are dealing with trauma have the support that they need. Long-term, these are more the efforts that it's gonna take all of us working together to make sure that Lakewood continues to be the great safe community that it is. 
you know, reducing access to guns. This is guns. This is a nationwide issue. Um, I recently uh, prepared some advocacy lever letters um, at both the state and regional level advocating for um, stricter gun, uh, gun laws. Um, also, we're working on a community stewardship program. Uh, Councilwoman Keppel uh, sat with us in the Human Services Department. Uh, we're really going to look to partner with Metro Health and then uh, also look at what Slavic Village did in terms of their stewardship program um, and have these stewards out in the community and talking about trauma, talking about gun violence um, and getting the whole community together. And um, that, that is very much in its infancy. Um, we don't want to launch it too quickly because we want this to be a successful long-term program. Um, but myself, our human services director, Tony Gelsimino, uh, and others are really working on trying to get the stewardship program launched within our community. Also long-term, we're going to work with the Lakewood Outdoor Basketball Community uh, Committee on mentorship programs. For the past few years, um, there's been one mentor that's kind of traveled between uh, parks uh, to mentor youth um, at the basketball courts. Um, I have uh, tripled that grant opportunity to LOBC and hoping that we can get more community mentors at the basketball courts. I'm very encouraged to see everything that's been going on at Madison Park basketball courts. It's really such a great um, community event that seems to have happened on Saturdays with many people going up there and enjoying the park and enjoying the basketball courts. And that's exactly what we want to see. And then finally, um, working with the anti-racism task force as well to make sure that all members of our community, uh, especially those in the BIPOC community who are disproportionately impacted by gun related violence to make sure that they are um, uh, addressed and everyone feels safe and welcome in our community. Next slide, please. Switching gears a bit, but I wanted to put this slide into the presentation to talk a little bit about Lakewood Police Department. Um, you know, we've sworn in many new officers right lately. Um, and, and whenever I talk before that swearing in, I really think that Lakewood Police Department uh, is really one of the best police departments around. Um, their professionalism and their training. Um, the, the Lakewood Police Department goes far above the state guidelines for training of its police officers. And that's really shown um, in, in, in how, how our police officers interact with our community. We also have this award-winning crisis intervention team. Um, the crisis intervention officers are specially trained um, and, uh, and they recognize and assist those that are suffering from a mental health crisis. Um, so we have right now 27 members who've received the specialized training. Um, it's not for everyone, but those members that we see could benefit be, by being trained in crisis intervention will go through that training. And a lot of credit has to be given to former Chief Malley, who uh, retired last year. He was recognized as the CIT Officer of the Year in 2018. So that's a very important training program and program for our department um, that we're going to continue uh, to train officers in that crisis intervention uh, team. Next slide, please. Okay, 2020. So um, again, switching gears off of safety a little bit. Um, and this is how I imagined my presentation starting off before we had some of this uptick in crime. But I wanted to talk about, you know, the last year, what we've been. Last year was my first year as mayor. Um, it was the most challenging year for each and every one of us, both personally, professionally. All of us have been impacted by COVID-19. The next couple of slides, um, just talk a little bit about what we at City Hall did uh, to ensure that the services that our residents expect uh, um, were delivered during uh, an unprecedented pandemic. So next slide, please. So uh, COVID-19 response. So uh, early on, I created an internal uh, COVID-19 task force. Um, being within the third month of my administration, um, it was important for me to bring together representatives from every department. Um, and we would begin to meet every morning. And we met every morning at 9 a.m., I think it was at 9 a.m., uh, for months and months um, to discuss, okay, what 
do does every department need to keep them to keep our employees safe but also what does every department need to make sure that we're delivering the services that Lakewood residents expect during an unprecedented pandemic. For instance, refuse. Um, some municipalities um, stopped either their bulk pickup or um, did bulk pickup only once a month, what have you. Uh, our refuse department did not stop bulk pickup. Um, we were able to manage through the pandemic um, so that those services were del still delivered to our um, to our community members, but also keep our uh, employees safe. We still meet, uh, we're down to about once a month where our COVID task force still meets um, to discuss what sort of needs we need. Um, and, um, you know, it's been very impactful and helpful um, to deliver services to the community. Um, we did work on limit exposure of COVID uh, to our residents, obviously, um, but we also uh, wanted to communicate with our residents. We created two web pages very early on, devoted to providing up to date information uh, about COVID. If you can think back, think back to March of 2020, and we are all looking for different news outlets. We're all trying and grappling and grasping for information. My thought was, let's dedicate a page here at City Hall, here at Lakewood, where we can bring in the state information, the, the federal information, the information from Lakewood, so people had one place that they could go to get timely relevant information on COVID. So we had the coronavirus page, and then we had the business resources page, uh, which are still up and running today that we update regularly. Uh, we did provide regular updates on our social media channels, um, we also created a local phone line. This was very early on. Um, uh, remember when this hit, and, and still to this day, the COVID-19 has disproportionately affected those uh, in, the, in the senior population. Um, my thought was a lot of information was being uh, relayed via social media, via web pages. Well, many of our senior population, perhaps they don't have a computer. So I wanted them to know that there was a phone line available they could hear a recorded message um, that we would record regularly about COVID-19. So I wanted to make sure that we we're hitting all parts of our community with relevant information about the pandemic. Um, we also uh, did mail some correspondence to residents with information uh, about COVID-19. I remember one Sunday uh, afternoon, me and Chief Dumphy um, had packets of letters that we delivered to all of the senior centers. Um, and it had that phone number on it and it had information on it because um, I wanted to make sure, again, those in our community that weren't on social media, they weren't on the web, that they knew that we were here and we were prepared and we were going to help them get through the pandemic. Um, internally, we created a COVID-19 playbook. Um, so our HR department worked uh, very hard on this COVID-19 playbook so that in our employees had a resource and a place to go uh, to look for how that we were handling COVID-19. And if they had questions, they could look in that playbook. Um, and I'm really proud to say that the reductions in service were minimalized and no full-time workers uh, were laid off at the city of Lakewood because of the pandemic. I don't know many other municipalities that can say that. Um, we were facing some uh, severe potential revenue losses. And with the next slide, we'll talk about some of the fiscal austerity measures we put in place, but we did not lay off anyone um, during that time. That means our employees were able to go home, they were able to get a paycheck, they were able to feed their families, and they're also able to provide those services like the refuse bulk pickup that I mentioned um, to, our, to, our, uh, to our community. Next slide, please. So some of the fiscal austerity measures that we took um, uh, early on and throughout the pandemic really helped us meet our budget at the end of the year. Uh, early on in April, we had a freezes in hiring, travel, training, new contract services, overtime, what have you. Um, we eliminated or uh, deferred big projects. Um, for instance, the Cove Church project, which I'm very excited is moving forward. Now, it was a really tough decision where um, I had to come to council and say, you know, we really need to pause this project. 
It's a roughly $5 million project and such an important project to our community, but we hadn't started the construction yet. And with facing nearly uh, uh, early estimates of nearly a $5 million revenue loss, the, the best move was to just pause the project till we could get our finances kind of under control to see how this was gonna impact Lakewood. And then we were able to resume the project within a couple months. And I'm, I'm happy to say it should be open to the public um, first quarter of 2022. Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel our community events. Um, even this year, we've had to change or cancel some of them as well. We're just not out of the woods yet. Um, but those are some of the fiscal austerity measures that help us, uh, that did help us uh, last year save some, some revenue um, by, uh, by canceling those. And then uh, all of our departments reported all COVID-19 related expenses to finance uh, for CARES Act purposes. We also uh, instituted two uh, major cost saving programs. First was an overtime reduction that saved the city uh, over uh, half a million dollars. And then we also worked with uh, the state of Ohio and uh, started Shared Work Ohio, which was a voluntary furlough program where we saved nearly $500,000 in, um, in, in uh, salary costs through that voluntary furlough program. So. Um, really worked hard to make sure that uh, we were going to come out of COVID um, in a good place financially. Uh, and then finally, we're the, one of the very first communities to establish a residential rent relief program, uh, pardon me, a small business rent relief program, and then later a residential rent relief program. Uh, we launched our small business rent relief program in March of 2020. When the pandemic hit and we got into that phase of the, um, the lockdown, if you will, I realized very early on that if our small businesses, which are the backbone of our community, Lakewood, we are known for our small businesses. If they're not able to be opened, um, then they're not able to pay the next month's rent. So we released, uh, we, we released that small business program. And to date, we have helped over 203 small businesses and provided over $750,000 in grant assistance to keep those small businesses afloat. And, and Director Leininger will talk a little bit about that during his presentation. And we also uh, helped residents. We provided $1.1 million in residential rent relief, helping over 614 households. So those are some of the programs that we put in place to make sure um, that people were able to stay in their homes, that our small businesses were able to stay afloat. And I'm really proud of the fact that Lakewood is one of the few communities um, that, has, that hasn't had a sharp decline in occupancy in our commercial corridor, uh, commercial corridors, um, and I do need to give a lot of credit to the planning department and the team of that small business program. Next slide, please. Okay, so 2021, where we're going? Um, COVID nineteen is still a major focus, and it impacts every department uh, to this day. Uh, we're getting we're getting close as more and more people get vaccinated. Um, that's really the only way that we're going to get back to normal. I myself am so happy. I've, I've got both of my shots. I got the Pfizer shot last month. Um, please encourage your family, your friends, make sure you go out and get vaccinated because that's really the only way um, that we're going to be be done with COVID. Um, however, uh, with COVID, there's still a lot of work to be done and work that we're doing here at the city. Uh, I, pardon me, here at the city. One of the things that I talked about when I was running for mayor um, was enhanced communications from city hall um, and trying to engage with residents more. Now it's been really difficult for me to kind of get out because I can't because of COVID and talk to our community. Um, but some of the things that we've implemented are, um, we've enhanced our social media and our website presence. Um, and we've developed a new e-newsletter. The link on your screen is how you can sign up. So monthly, uh, we're distributing right to your email box an e-newsletter that gives you information of what's happening here at the city and all the things that we're doing. Um, and then another thing that we're working on is we are launching a new website. So One Lakewood will be going away and it will be transitioning to lakewoodoh.gov. Um, this is a secure government website. Um, 
And really, it's important in this day and age to have a secure government website um, uh, for anyone that visits our website. Uh, recently, um, the Cybersecurity Office uh, is actually requesting that municipalities use the .gov rather than a .com. So uh, with that, we're going to be moving to the liquidoh.gov website. That should be coming at the end of the month. The current website will be um, available for about a year and it'll automatically direct you to the new website. Um, and then uh, for 2021 and beyond, water sewer infrastructure updates, which I'll talk a bit uh, about in the next slide. And then we continue to invest in our parks, in our tree canopy. And uh, again, Director Leininger is gonna talk a lot about of uh, the development going on within the city. So water sewer updates. Uh, I wanted to provide everyone an update on where we are with the implementation of our integrated wet weather improvement plan or uh, what we call the IWIP for short. Um, part of this includes a review of our current water and sewer rate structure. Uh, this is a large complex plan that has been in the works for many years. Um, and the IWIP has been approved by city council is actually approved by council when I was on council. Um, but our next step is to look at equitable ways to pay for these required water and sewer updates. So Lakewood's uh, Lakewood system, our water, system, uh, water sewer system is unique. Uh, and that is actually a benefit to Lakewood. What that means is both that the Ohio and US uh, regulators understand that Lakewood is a unique system. Um, the sewers that were built, and you can see a, an old picture of about 1920, um, they were built at the turn of the last century as independent projects. Um, and they moved household sewage away from homes as efficiently as possible, but they did discharge directly into the lake or the river. The system itself was connected decades later. Some of our sewers were built with a single pipe combined sewer, but most of Lakewood was built with two pipes, a storm and a sanitary. Regulators have recognized this uniqueness and that's important because they're working with us to find the best projects to address our unique system. Uh, and on your screen there is kind of the, um, the over under uh, storm and sanitary sewer that we have here in Lakewood. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Lakewood has continuously invested in our water sewer system. And this has been really important when we work with the US and Ohio regulators. We've raised our capture and ability to treat from 79 to 85%. That's really important. There's many communities spending millions of dollars to get there, but Lakewood we're, uh, is there. But since we're on Lake Erie and the Rocky River watersheds, we have higher levels of control that we need to meet. The high rate treatment plant, uh, pardon me, the high rate treatment project down at the plant will raise our percentage of capture to 88%. And our five year IWIP blocks plan to invest $50 million on the next two cycles. We'll then be able to remove 95% of the pollutants that come from our sipsher to come from our system captured and treated. This is a massive investment, um, but we have to put the most bang for our buck um, projects and investments up front uh, as we invest in water sewer. Additionally, we keep up with regular uh, water sewer improvements to, to continue to meet our IWIP. For instance, both Andrews and Gladys are slated to have water main replacements in 2022. So we continue to speak regularly with the US and Ohio EPA regulators, uh, and they continue to agree that our IWIP plan is the correct path forward. We had hoped to hear on whether or not we would have a consent decree by the end of last year, uh, but COVID delayed that response from them. And we should hear something by the end of the year on whether or not they will issue a consent decree. Uh, city, as mentioned before, city council approved the IWIP and has approved rate increases through 2023. Uh, the regulators see this as a strong sign of our commitment to the implementation of the IWIP. The question is for 2023 and after, 
how do we afford these required capital sewer projects? We need to determine what is equitable and how we meet those needs. The current rate system is based on water usage. Increases from the high rate treatment plant and improvements to date, but we need to find additional increases to fund the next phase of the IWIP. And the structure of those increases will be very important. We have a very old system and a plan that needs continuous improvement as well, which requires more funding in the years ahead. But we try to use the benefit of time to get something started so that predictable and small rate increases are equitable. Next slide, please. So communities that get into trouble are communities that spike increases uh, that really hurts those in our community that are trying to budget. Our current rates are based on water usage, but as you can see from the slide over the past 20 years, our water usage continues to decline due to smaller household sizes and smart water utilities. With the continued decrease in usage, this has now made it unstable. Costs on the sewer side are wet weather driven. Uh, so the way the rates are set now is that those with large parking lots that don't use a lot of water, they impact the equity because they don't use a lot of water and they, and they put a lot of water into the sewer system due to rain runoff. So what we're doing now is we're looking at an impervious or fixed fee to balance these rates so that our community is not dependent on risky trends. Many communities in our region use a fixed charge or impervious area charges, including uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, Columbus, Elyria, et cetera, and they're very commonplace now in most districts. Next slide, please. Uh, these discussions and the implementation of the IWEP, uh, again, it's been ongoing for years. In 2019, there were public meetings held and uh, public input was asked. The impervious charge was what the majority of the public agreed was the most equitable. So we are currently reviewing the ch a change to our rate structure to count, account for these impervious areas. Uh, we are making good progress on the implementation of our IWAP, and I'm looking forward to having more discussions with our community um, uh, this summer and, and this fall as well. So that's the update I have on my end. Uh, obviously a lot more going on, but I wanted to touch on uh, a few major areas uh, before turning it over to Director of Planning and Development, Sean Leininger. Sean joined our team in July of 2020. Sean has over 20 years of municipal planning, zoning, community and ec economic development experience. Um, previously, he was assistant town manager in Bluffton, South Carolina. He was Director of Public Service and Development for our neighbor to the West Fairview Park. And we were able to acquire him from his most recent position as Executive Director of Cuyahoga County Planning Commission. He's currently the Vice Chair of the Northeast Ohio First Sur Suburbs Development Council. He has a master's in city and regional planning from Ohio State University. Um, we are very fortunate and lucky to have Sean here in Lakewood and on our team. Um, I'm, I'm going to embarrass Sean. He knows what's coming. I've said this before, but I meet monthly with the West Side mayors. And every time we talk about planning, they always ask me, how's Sean doing? Is he happy? Because they would, they would love to snatch him up. And I said, lay off of Sean. He's all Lakewood. See, he is, he's such a talented in, individual. I've been so impressed working with him. And really, we're, we're lucky to have him here at Lakewood. So with that, Sean, why don't you uh, kick off your uh, part of the presentation? And hopefully, I did not make it too embarrassed or red with that. <laughs> Oh, Mary, you make me blush every time you say it. So thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for the introduction. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity to be part of your state of the city. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share what the, the great things that are going on in the city and, and, and be part of this with you. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to take the same theme that the mayor had, talk about where we've been and, 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 and where we're going. And we're going to talk about development projects and we're going to talk about some city projects. Uh, that are that are in the in the works for this year and, and some of them are maybe a, a little bit farther out. Uh, but to begin, uh, and really because of this is where we've spent so much of our time in the last year, 
I want to touch upon the various uh, support programs that the city established uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so as the mayor said, shortly after the issuance of the stay at home order that would ultimately shut down all businesses in the state for two months, uh, the city launched several programs, including a small business assistance program, and soon after that, a residential rent assistance program. Uh, the small business program provides up to $7,000 in rent or job retention assistance to qualifying businesses having up to 50 employees. Now in Lakewood, since we're so small business driven, that, that includes most businesses in the city. Uh, alternatively, the residential assistance program provides rent assistance to income qualified residents that have or are being financially impacted by the pandemic. Uh, so aside from those financial programs, we did also uh, provide a, a, a several non-financial assistance programs to help support businesses and customers, uh, including creating an express parking program that maintains 15 minute high turnover spaces 24 seven, ultimately with the goal of, social, of supporting socially distanced drop off and pick up shopping and dining. And so it, on this slide, you can see a picture of one of those signs. Hopefully you've, you, you've seen those and hopefully you're taking advantage of a couple of dozen of those that exist. Uh, throughout our community. Uh, additionally, to create more opportunities for outdoor dining, uh, we flexed our dimensional and locational standards, as well as limited the time of year restrictions for outdoor dining so that we could have more opportunities to dine outside. Again, socially distanced, but the, uh, the directives from the CDC and others have said that it's, it's better to be outside. And so we've been able to create over two dozen uh, additional outdoor dining venues uh, around the city. Uh, that hopefully you had a, a chance to, to, to have lunch or, or have dinner at. And those continue and those will remain through, through 2022. Uh, before I move on from this topic, I wanted to share with you the results from the city's efforts in providing COVID-19 assistance over the past year. And so the mayor shared with you some of these numbers. Uh, and this far we've provided just over 614 residential rent assistance applications. What's important about that is how many people it's actually helped uh, so of those 614 applications, that turns into over 1,100 residents uh, that we've been able to provide assistance to in the city. We've also approved 203 applications for Lakewood businesses uh, as part of the Small Business Assistance Program. Uh, to date, we've awarded over $1.1 million uh, in residential assistance and over $750,000 in, in small business assistance. In total, we have uh, just over $1.3 million available for, res for, the, for the residents of this community. Uh, and just over $900,000 for small businesses. And, and so really what that means is that there's money that's still available. Uh, so if you are a business or you're a renter in the city that qualifies, or, or perhaps you know somebody that does, please reach out to our partners at Lakewood Alive for the small business assistance uh, or the Lakewood Community Services Center for the residential rent assistance and really take advantage of this, of this resource while it's available from the city. Uh, the funds are limited at this point. We don't know if more funds will be available. So please, please take advantage of it. So let's, we're going to shift gears a couple of times. So this is our first shift. Uh, we're moving on to development activity in, in Lakewood. Uh, one of the great indicators of, of strength uh, of investment in the community and what's happening in the community is our building permit activity. So in 2020, uh, both permit activity and construction valuation remain strong. Uh, in fact, we had the fourth highest permit volume year and the fifth highest construction value year out of the last 10 years. Now, keep in mind, that's also with two months of a total shutdown in our community and around the state. Now, as the mayor noted, moving forward, COVID-19 is absolutely impacting uh, projects through labor supply, material availability, and especially material prices. And so this is causing delays in projects. Doesn't mean those projects have stopped or they've, they've, they've taken them off the table. They're still moving forward. So. So, and I'll talk about some of these projects here shortly, but those large scale projects that, that you're aware of, the downtown site, the Solaw project, the Studio West project out at the east end of Detroit, they're still advancing just at a slower pace. But, but over the next two to three years, those projects alone are gonna bring over $150 million in permit activity to the city, or nearly $150 million in permit activity to the city. Another great indicator of investment, especially in a bedroom community like the city of Lakewood are, are home sales. And so this slide indicates what's been happening the last five years in the single family home market. So the median sales price has increased 56% from $154,000 in 2016 to $240,000 in 2020. If we look back a little farther to, to just off the slide to, to, to 2011, 
when the median sales price was just over $112,000, the increase to 2020 is 114%. So not only are our homes selling for more, more of them are selling and they're not staying on the market long. So the rest of the, the, the graphs on this slide show that 586 single family homes were sold in 2020. Uh, that is a 10 year high. And at the same time, the median days on the market was 30 days, uh, which is a 10 year low. And one thing, another item that just a, a little quick note about those, those 586 home sales, 55% of them uh, were at or above list price, uh, which is tremendous and, and, and really indicates the strength of the market uh, that we all heard about this happening nationwide, but it is, is absolutely happening here uh, in our community. And while this is all great news for homeowners that are looking to sell their homes, it does put tremendous pressure on the affordability of Lakewood. Uh, the city is fortunate that we do have an award-winning affordable housing strategy that helps guide our investment uh, into affordable housing initiatives. Uh, and primarily what we do is we invest federal community development block grants or CDBG funds, and as well as home funds, which are also federal dollars. Uh, we invest those funds into the construction and rehab of, of owner occupied and rental housing that ultimately supports income qualified households. Uh, in that regard, in 2020, the city provided five, over $545,000 to support 44 properties, uh, including the rehab and sale of a home on Orchard Grove. Uh, in addition to rehab, repair, uh, accessibility, and, and uh, even the maintenance programs that we manage, uh, this year we are building two new single family homes that will be sold to income qualified households. And, and so the images that are on your slide here are, are, are actually those two homes, uh, one on Plaw, I'm sorry, one on Shaw and the other on Plover. Uh, so in addition to investing these federal funds in affordable housing, we also do make available a property tax abatement incentive to developers that, that provide affordable housing as part of their projects. And I'll talk about the, the first two projects that are taking advantage of that tax abatement uh, here in a couple of slides. So let's shift gears a little bit again. Uh, let's update everybody on a, on a few of the major development projects in the city. And we'll start with the downtown redevelopment site. Uh, so a lot has, has changed in this property in the past year or two. Uh, if we were to look back to 2018, 2019, we, looking at the same image, we would have seen the hospital sitting here. Uh, and also, as you're likely aware, last year, uh, the city separated from the previous developer. And at that time, we were planning to pivot towards Casto and North Point Realty, who was the other uh, developer that was selected through that 2017 RFP process that the city conducted. So this past December, city council approved this pivot to Casto and North Point. And since then, in recognizing that there's been a lot of changes, significant changes to the site since 2017, We've been working with Casto and North Point Realty to, to update them on the current site conditions. And in turn, they are modifying their plans accordingly. At the same time, we are also negotiating a, a term sheet with Casto uh, that's gonna provide the basis for a more detailed development agreement that will be finalized really as we get deeper into design and approval process. Uh, we've also re-engaged with the advisory panel that was originally created uh, to, to evaluate RFP submittals. Their role now is to help us help advise us on this updated proposal from Casto. Uh, and so as this updated proposal takes shape, uh, we'll be advancing into the public review and zoning processes in the, in the next couple of months. So please know that there's a lot happening uh, in, the, in, the, in the form of updating plans, given that it's been four years since this developer was on this site. A lot has changed, the market has changed. But as, as they start to re constitute that plan, uh, we'll be out in front of the community to, to share uh, with all of you what their plan is and, and get your input on it as we start to, 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 to comment on it as it comes farther down the, the approval process. So continuing on, there's, there's Solov Development has two projects that, that sit almost equidistant from the downtown redevelopment site. Uh, the first is the former Barry Buick properties that are located on Detroit between Cranford and uh, Rosewood. Uh, this is, of course, in Ward 2. Um, the project's known as the View West. It's a mixed-use project, project with 160 units that are spread across four stories and has a first floor commercial space. Uh, as I shared a couple of slides ago, um, the previous the, the city has made available a, a tax incentive to provide affordable housing. 
So this, along with the View East, which I'll talk about next, also a solar project, those will be the first two projects that will, that will utilize this incentive. And so what that means in this case is that 20% of the building, or since there's 160 units, there'd be 32 units, that would be made affordable for a period of 15 years in exchange for a 15 year tax abatement on the improved value of the property. So Solov will continue to pay the same taxes that exist today. They simply won't pay any taxes on the improved value for a period of 15 years while those, while those 32 affordable units remain available. Uh, right now, Solov is currently working uh, to complete their property acquisitions as well as construction drawings. Uh, we continue to have uh, regular conversations with them on this site as well as the View East. Uh, and we really still expect this project to be under construction uh, here later this year. And so this is uh, a rendering of the, of the buildings looking east and kind of south across Detroit uh, at, the, at the View West buildings. So the, the second of the Solov projects is the former Spitzer Chrysler site that's near Detroit and, and Bunce. So the View East is really a smaller sibling to the View West. It's, it's also a mixed use project, uh, but instead of 160 units, uh, it only has 120 units. Also spread across four stories and, and a couple of buildings. Uh, it has first floor commercial space included as a, in, with it as well. Uh, this project will also in, include affordable housing units. Uh, in this case, same math as the previous one, there's 20% of the building or 120 units. Of, or of the 120 units or 24 units will actually be made affordable for a period of 15 years with the same tax abatement that I explained on the previous, previous development. Uh, so this project's a little bit farther behind than the View West. Uh, Solov is currently working with the Architectural Board of Review on this project. Actually, while we're having this conversation, they're having the pre-review meeting in a room over from me. Um, and so construction-wise, we're gonna be about six months behind uh, the View West. And so this is a rendering, this is focused on one building. Both buildings are very similar in style, but this is also looking east down Detroit um, and a little bit south uh, or towards the, you can kind of see the, um, the intersections here in the, in, the, in, the, in the rendering. So this is, again, this is in front of ABR. So there may be some, some tweaks to this, but generally this gives you a good sense of what the, what the project will look like uh, when it's built. So finally, for the major development updates, uh, Daniel Budish and Betsy Figgy are our leading development team that, that will convert the former Mac products manufacturing space on, on Hurt Avenue behind the former Fantasy Nightclub uh, into an LGBTQ entertainment and restaurant venue. So this is a 20,000 square foot adapter reuse project. It's going to be occupied by a Latinx restaurant. It'll have a pizza kitchen. Uh, but the, really the signature of it is there's a new rec facility uh, uh, that'll have a mezzanine track, ultimately with the goal of supporting fitness, volleyball, dodgeball, and primarily the Stonewall sports community. So this is a rendering of the Fieldhouse Project, a restaurant and other uses towards the front, the recreation centers back towards the back. Um, this is the first phase of a multi-phase project that will also include the, the historic rehab of the former Fantasy Nightclub. Um, which is also gonna provide a range of opportunities and support for the LGBTQ community. Uh, when it's complete, the Studio West, which is between the two buildings as, as, as the complex is called, it's called Studio West. Uh, it'll, it'll serve not only as an anchor for the gay community, but also for the Eastern Detroit Avenue gateway into our city. Uh, building permit drawings for this, this project have been submitted. Uh, so we're looking for this to start uh, probably mid 2021, maybe into the fall. Uh, the fantasy rehab is a little bit farther behind. They're, they're currently in the planning and design phase, and that'll continue through this year uh, with construction to begin in 2022. So looking a little bit farther into 2021, uh, we have a number of other exciting projects that we're looking forward to, especially those that are centered on historic preservation and adaptive reuse. So the Marlowe townhomes, which are down at Madison and Marlowe are under construction right now. The Lake Avenue homes are the redevelopment of the former marathon site on Lake. Uh, that's scheduled to begin here in the next, uh, next few weeks, uh, probably by the end of this month, early June. Uh, Beck Center has a small uh, renovation project they're gonna do with the green space in front of, in front of their building. And then really what we're, we're, we're really, ex we're excited about all these, but we're really excited about the historic preservation and adaptive reuse of some of our historic structures in the community. Uh, St. James School and Rectory uh, is, is currently in front of our 
planning commission and our ABR uh, to, to adaptively reuse those buildings for office uses. Uh, Trinity Lutheran Church, which the city bought several years ago, we're working with Scalish Construction on the, the adaptive reuse of that for office uses as well. Uh, the Byright building in, in Birdtown, St. Cyril Methodius, that's also in Birdtown. And then coming soon, the former Board of Education offices on Warren Road that were recently acquired by Liberty Development. So there's a lot of good things happening on the historic preservation front in, in the community. So this is going to be the last time we'll change gears. We're going to change gears one more time, and we're going to focus in on some city projects uh, that are on the schedule for this year. So in, in 2019, the city acquired the former Cove Church for the purposes of, of, of consolidating the Human Services Department and their support for children through seniors into a single intergenerational location. So plans are now complete. Uh, and uh, are being bid for the adaptive reuse of the former church and construction will begin uh, later this summer. Uh, the site will also provide stormwater storage to assist the city in dealing with the combined sewer overflows into Lake Erie that the mayor mentioned as part of the IWIP plan. Um, that project's a little bit farther out. Um, uh, well, on the same site, they are unrelated. They can be done separately. Uh, so look for that project to happen in the, uh, probably in the next several years, uh, five to seven years out. Um, um, on, based on the IWIP plan. Uh, improvements are being made to Fire Station 2. Uh, these include the addition of an apparatus bay, uh, a dedicated equipment storage, and upgraded laundry facilities to, to really help improve the care and storage of the contaminated gear and clothing that, that firefighters uh, often have to, have to utilize and, and carry around with them um, while they're fighting, uh, fighting fires in our community. Uh, construction is currently underway uh, and scheduled to be complete later this year. So on, on May 24th, construction is going to begin on pedestrian safety, utility, and streetscape improvements uh, on Detroit Avenue between Sloan and Graver. Uh, so this project is going to make permanent some of the painted curb lines that you see out there today. Where it's going to reduce a curb lane on Detroit to support pedestrian safety. Uh, and ultimately support the continuation of the Metro Park's all-purpose trail that's currently in the Rocky, Reser Rocky River Reservation running along Valley Parkway. It's going to be continued out of the park along the south side of Detroit Avenue uh, and up over to Graber. And then future uh, bikeway pedestrian improvements will carry it from Graber to other points in the community, um, as well as then back to uh, the Metro Parks via Hogsback, Hogsback Road. Um, so in addition to all that, this will create an opportunity for stormwater improvements. Uh, it also help us create a softer, greener gateway into the community, particularly at the Sloan intersection at the bend uh, near Graber in front of Harry Buffalo. So these are some renderings that are looking at the north, northeast corner of Detroit and Sloan and at the bend in Harry Buffalo, uh, really creating landscape opportunities along with the opportunity to put in high quality materials and some public art interventions. And so on these slides, I don't know, hopefully you can see my cursor, but uh, you'll see the, these are public art interventions that are planned. This is not what it's gonna look like. There's a, there's a separate call for artists that we're currently in the middle of. Uh, here's another uh, location here in front of Harry Buffalo. Uh, so, so, so creating some public art interventions along the corridor and really create a true gateway entry into the city uh, as you come across the, the bridge from Rocky River. So as the mayor shared, the city is making significant improvements to its uh, sewer infrastructure. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant has the high rate treatment facility nearly complete. Uh, so this facility is really gonna help us process high volume flows to the sewer plant that occur during certain rain events, particularly heavy rain events, and, 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 and help eliminate the need to overflow, need to overflow our sewers into, into the Rocky River. So commissioning and testing are, are ongoing through this year. And uh, we hope that the HRT, the high, high High rate treatment facility will, will be in operation in 2022. So along with the HRT facility, uh, the, there is a digester project that's nearly complete and is currently under commission and testing. So what a digester does is it helps break down organic waste that's captured and processed at the plant. Um, and that'll be fully operational uh, this summer. We're, we're changing a lot of topics here, but now we'll talk a little bit about some electric vehicle charging stations that are that are plan for the city. And the city's really been very fortunate to receive uh, funding from, from, from outside sources. So we received $35,000 from NOPEC and another $15,000 very recently from the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. 
uh, to help support the expansion of electric vehicle charging stations in the city. So this year we have four new locations that will be added uh, with dual port level two stations and they'll be added at uh, Madison Park, City Hall, Lakewood Park, uh, as well as on the Detroit Extension near, near Rio Street. Uh, there's a bank of angled parking spaces if you've ever been, if you've been down that area. Uh, it'll be in one, uh, two of those parking spaces will be utilized for, for, for a level two charging station. And so really this is an addition to the three existing stations that we already have. One of which is downtown, uh, the other is at Raising Canes on Park Haven Row, and, and, and the level three, a fast charger, over at Winterhurst. And so before we focus in on some Ward 2 projects, the city does maintain a spectacular vernacular public art program that ultimately creates private partnerships uh, in, in support of public art. And so the, on this slide, there's, here's a few ex recent examples that we've sprinkled a couple of others uh, throughout this presentation this evening. Um, if, if you'd like to know more about these locations and where they're at, especially as the weather's getting nice, get out, walk around. Uh, there's a lot of great selfie spots in front of these. Uh, if you go to the city's website, which is onelakewood.com currently, it's changing to lakewoodoh.gov slash public art. It'll still be slash public art, whether it's onelakewood.com or lakewoodoh.gov. Um, you'll find an interactive map where you can see all the locations. You can pull up pictures uh, of, of, of the art installations that are throughout the city. Uh, and hopefully get out and explore, explore, explore the community uh, while the weather's nice. So let's focus now uh, the last few slides on, on some Ward 2 projects. Uh, so improvements to Kaufman Park uh, went out to bid last week uh, with work beginning later this summer. Uh, this project's going to be a, provide a major update to the park, including ADA accessibility improvements from the Detroit entrance, we're gonna provide a circuit walking path, a picnic shelter, uh, and also an upgraded play equipment that's going to have a, a nature-based theme. Uh, and then ultimately, we're also gonna add a new water play feature uh, in the park. Uh, we're we're gonna also be introducing some public art into the project and we're, by repurposing the blades of grass that you currently see at the Detroit intersection uh, and Detroit Sloan intersection to bring those uh, uh, in, into this park. I uh, would like to thank Cuyahoga County for making available $50,000 in grant funds um, to help support this project using casino funds um, that the city, that the county awards to, to communities for, for projects such as this. So built in the 1950s and last updated in the 1980s, Foster Pool will begin a renovation in their future. So the, the city is currently soliciting proposals, actually we just received the proposals uh, from design firms that really to help lead us through the public input and design process. And that will kick off later this summer. So look for more information about that process as we, as we get on board with the contractor in the next couple of months. Uh, the, the goal is to move from the design process into construction. However, there's a lot of details we need to work through as part of the design. Um, and so stay tuned for more information on, 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 on when construction will take place, but absolutely design will, will kick off uh, this summer. Um, can you know with some of the city projects, there are major improvements planned for Hillier Road. Currently, the city is uh, designing a resurfacing project that will begin at the, the bridge over to Rocky River and extend east uh, to Warren Road. Um, in addition to this resurfacing project, we're going to be adding bike lanes to the roadway, very similar to what we did on Lake Avenue. Uh, the design uh, will be complete this year with construction to occur in 2022. At the same time, while we're doing this, Cuyahoga County is also planning to replace the Hilliard Bridge that is over the Rocky River. And they're currently working on their design plans. And those plans are, will be, are, will, the effort on those plans will continue through this year and it'll be complete in 22 with work scheduled to begin in 2023. And that will be a multi-year construction project, uh, but there will be uh, a, a significant amount of information as we get, get closer to that project about detours and routing and, and how to navigate the, uh, the loss of the, of the Hilliard uh, Road Bridge for, for, for a period of a couple of years. So stay tuned uh, for that project in the future. And so really, as we close out now, uh, there are a number of other repair and rehab projects that are taking place in Ward 2 this year. Uh, the Summit Avenue uh, outfall rehabilitation is scheduled to begin in July and will be substantially complete in December. The Leedale Water Main replacement project is on a similar schedule, and while the remaining projects that you see listed under Water Main replacement 
um, are they're in various stages of design or planning with construction to be scheduled in 2022. So the projects that are in design will be set up for construction in 2022. The projects that are in planning will move into design in 22 and construction in 23. Uh, and then later this year, we'll be working to optimize um, signal timing on Detroit Avenue. And we'll do that through the addition of GPS timing devices on each signal uh, to ensure that, ensure that they stay in sync with each other. Uh, right now, they work on analog devices. And if you ever had a watch and wind it, 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 loses, it loses pace with time over time. Um, and that's what happens with our signals right now. And so when it feels like they're out of sync and you're stopping at red lights, it, 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 it could be because of the fact that the signal timing is off. GPS timing allows us to utilize the satellite timing and put everything on, on the same time frame. So we, we hopefully uh, lose those, those imbalances in, in timing. So that's all I have. It's, it's been a, obviously it's been a, it's been a really busy year. We have an even busier year on the horizon. So this is our contact information for Mayor George and myself. Um, there's our email address, our phone number. You're certainly welcome to reach out with us with questions, comments. Um, we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. And so with that, Mayor, I'll turn it over to you. And again, thank you for the opportunity this evening. Thanks, Director Leininger. And thank you everybody for joining us this evening on our Ward 2 uh, virtual State of the City presentation. Hopefully you came away from this presentation learning a lot of what we've done and kind of what we're doing in 2021 and beyond. Um, if you have questions that weren't addressed during the presentation itself, reach out to Sean or myself and we will get back to you with those questions. So have a good evening. Thank you again for taking your time for being here and uh, make sure you get your, your vaccine shot so we can get out of this COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks everybody, have a good evening. Bye-bye.